Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this online policy briefing organized by the European Policy Center entitled Repower EU uh, towards more affordable, secure and sustainable energy. My name is Simon de Kerel. I am the policy analyst for climate and energy for the Sustainable Prosperity for Europe program of the European Policy Center, and I will be moderating uh, the event for you today. Thank you to all the people who are joining us, uh, and I look uh, forward to the discussion. This policy briefing will look at Repower EU, uh, the plan proposed by the Commission last month in light of the Russian aggression in Ukraine to phase out the EU's dependence on Russian fossil fuels over the next few years. Uh, this event will focus on the measures it puts forward as well as the plan's implications for reaching the objectives of the Green Deal and for the affordability and security of the European energy supply. The Repower EU plan sets a target uh, of a complete phase out of Russian gas and European energy mix well before 2030. It contains measures that fit uh, into four uh, general areas, saving energy, diversifying supplies, accelerating the clean energy transition and so-called smart investment. It proposes among other things, uh, higher energy efficiency and renewable targets for 2030 uh, streamlining, streamlining permitting procedures for renewable energy projects, uh, a, legal, a legally binding obligation for solar panels on new buildings, uh, diversification uh, via LNG and renewable gases, and additional investments in energy infrastructure. Together, these measures have to eliminate the EU's dependence on Russian gas while accelerating the clean energy transition. Joining us today uh, from the Commission is Tatiana Marquez, a uh, member of cabinet of Energy Commis Commissioner Kadri Simpson, who will first present the Repower EU plan and give us some more insight uh, into the concrete measures proposed by the Commission and to give us an idea, an idea of how these will deliver a European energy supply that is secure, sustainable, as well as affordable. After this presentation, we will have a few reactions from respondents, and then uh, the floor will be open for questions from the audience. Uh, I would encourage uh, participants to already write down any questions you may have during the presentation using the Q&A function of Zoom and to please uh, keep the question short uh, so it is easier for us to keep an overview. If you wish to do so, you may also intervene directly during the Q&A session by raising your hand in Zoom. Uh, so then without much uh, further ado, I would uh, like to give the floor to our speaker from the Commission, uh, Tatiana Marquez. Hello, everyone. Um, I would try to share my presentation with you. Up. Can you see it now? Simon? Uh, no, we can't see Not it yet. yet. Okay. Yeah, I have uh, an issue, I think. Um, I can maybe uh, try to share myself. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Ah, finally. Okay. So let me start from the very beginning of it. This you can see in the and blue. Now it's uh, now it's uh, gone again. Actually, it's gone again. <laughs> okay. Um, how can I? Um, mm. 
really apologies, but it's it just disappears from my um okay. Yes, I can also uh, share, but I don't have a, a latest version, I think. What about now? No. Um, yes, yes. Ah, finally. Very good. Okay, excellent. Shall we start a little bit late? <laughs> yes. Sorry for that. Um, thanks a lot, Simon, for the introduction. Um, I would like to spend some 12, uh, 15 minutes with you just um, uh, explaining a bit uh, what is behind the Repower EU plan that, uh, that the Commission adopted on the 18th of May. And the first thing I would like to do is to present you a bit the um, uh, where we are and uh, where we come from um, with this um, with this plan. Um, uh, I mean, in the last months, as you know, uh, many things have has have happened very quickly. Uh, we started uh, with the uh, Ukraine inv invasion that um, somehow came um, a little bit unexpectedly for many um, on the 24th of February. But this was a wake up alert, I would say, uh, for the Commission and for many member states that the uh, the um, uh, the Russians were not anymore um, the reliable energy suppliers that um, that had been uh, had been for for for, for many years. Uh, indeed, very few afterwards we start we started having problems with uh, disruption of of gas supply into Europe with less and less amounts of gas coming from the pipelines that connect Russia to, to, to Eastern Europe. And uh, this is why the Commission um, already in a communication on the 8th of March uh, presented the, uh, the plan or presented the idea of coming up with, um, uh, with a new project, which was about phasing out um, not only Russian gas, but Russian, Russian fossil fuels. Uh, well before the end of the decade of the 2030. Um, this was um, discussed and well received from, um, by, the, uh, by the European leaders. We had in the Versailles declaration that uh, there was already um, a, a very clear intent from the, uh, from the EU leaders that the EU dependency on Russian gas, oil and coal had to finish. And uh, and uh, later on, um, it was in the um, in the European Council conclusions on the 24th and 25th of March a clear mandate for the Commission to come up with um, such a uh, such a plan to phase out Russian fossil fuels, and this is what we have called Repower EU. Um, the Commission did so on the 18th of March and on the 18th of May, so really really recently. And uh, already uh, in, at the European Council on the 30 and 31st of May, um, the, the European leaders uh, welcomed the plan and, um, and called for a number, of, um, a number of actions that are very much in line with the plan that the Commission has proposed. Um, and I will uh, cover uh, each of these areas right now. Uh, if you look at this graph, you can see that, well, um, Basically, we move around three, four main areas that we want to touch upon in order to ensure that we can uh, phase out uh, Russian fossil fuels. The first one is everything that has to do with uh, with savings of energy. Of course, you know that we have in the EU a very clear um, a very clear policy of uh, energy efficiency first meaning that first we will try to ensure that we consume as less, as less gas and fossil fuels uh, from Russia as possible before um, um, we even look into how to replace those fossil fuels with something else. Um, so what the plan includes, it's a very um, a clear um, strategy concerning energy efficiency and reduction of energy consumption. Uh, secondly, we want to, for those quantities that we still will need to, to consume, those quantities of, of fossil fuels that we will still need to consume, we want to replace them as much as possible with renewable um, energies. Renewable energies that are important for us because uh, they ensure that we can um, 
uh, we, we, we are producing the, the energy mostly in Europe and, uh, and, and create growth and jobs for European people. So uh, we see this as a very win-win situation in the sense that not only uh, we will become uh, less reliant on Russian gas and uh, external imports in general, but also we will be creating um, possibilities of growth in Europe. Uh, thirdly, um, for the gas that we will still need to um, to consume because we cannot fully uh, replace it with renewable uh, energies, uh, obviously our policy is that of diversification. So try to move to third suppliers, different from um, different from Russia. And and finally, what the plan includes, it's a strategy about how to ensure that the necessary investments uh, to phase out um, Russian fossil fuels take place in the very uh, in the very short term in the in the, in in the coming years. We have we calculated that around 200, 200 um, billion euros will be necessary in order to achieve this objective. On top of the investments that we had already foreseen as part of the decarbonization agenda of the Commission, so the fit for fifty fifth for fifty five objective. Uh, to um, reduce by 55% our uh, um, uh, greenhouse gases emissions by 2030 and to become carbon neutral by 2050. The first block, of course, as I said, is uh, saving energy. Um, what we propose in the uh, in the uh, in the Repower EU uh, is basically to ask very much and call on the member state to um, start campaigns for behavioral change of citizens and business, uh, meaning that we want that more and more people are engaged um, in, 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 in this project of phasing out Russian, Russian uh, fossil fuels, and that uh, people in general understand that it's important um, that we use energy uh, in a more efficient way and that we reduce our consumption as much as possible, uh, especially in the coming um, in the coming winter and probably in the next couple of years, which are likely to be the more difficult uh, period uh, in this process going um, uh, throughout the decade. Secondly, because this is what we would like to have immediately already happening in the member states, we also have proposed some kind of mid to long term energy efficiency measures. In particular, we want that we propose that the energy efficiency directive um, already increases its level of ambition to move from 9% to 13% of uh, energy uh, consumption reduction by 2030. Uh, we also are asking to the member states that uh, they should revise, when they revise in 2024, the national energy and climate plans, um, that they revise it in order to um, step up um, the ambition and to um, uh, take into account that we have now a new objective, which is this uh, Repower EU objective, uh, that was not taken uh, into account in the plans until now. In terms of um, saving energy, the plan come up, uh, comes up with uh, with um, itself with uh, with a strategy about how to do this in different sectors, from heating to transportation. And the Commission comes up uh, with uh, announcements about uh, new legislation that expects to to adopt in a number of sectors, like for instance uh, freight transport. Um, uh, we consider that with all these measures that we put at the table and will be developed in the coming in the coming weeks and months, um, uh, we may be able to achieve around five percent of um, gas savings uh, and about five percent of oil savings. The second uh, block that we look at, as I mentioned at the beginning, is trying to replace as much as possible um, the fossil fuels that we consume currently with um, with renewable and with renewable energy, uh, being it electricity or being it uh, gases. To do so, um, uh, the the plan provides also um, already um, puts uh, puts forward. 
a, a proposal to revise the existing renewals directive that has already been uh, where well, we already make a proposal for revision last July, but this we uh, we proposed it as a correction to our own proposal to increase the level of ambition um, uh, from 40 to 45 percent of renewable energy um, share in the EU by 2030. Uh, together with that, it's not only that we establish the, uh, the target that is higher, but we also come up, as, as you mentioned, Simon, uh, with uh, some important additional um, legislative proposals to be included in the, uh, in the renewals directive concerning uh, permitting of renewals. So, um, as many of you know, uh, one of the biggest stoppers of decarbonization today and energy transition is the fact that um, renewal permitting, re permitting of renewal installation is taking far too long in many member states, not everywhere, but in many member states. And that what we uh, what we want is that um, the renewal deployment um, uh, accelerates uh, massively in the coming years, and for that, for doing that, we we cannot afford that administrative burden or administrative procedures would um, uh, would hinder uh, the achievement of our objectives. Together with permitting, we also look into um, how to enhance the development of solar energy. We uh, come up with a new target of 320 gigawatts by 2025 and another 600 gigawatts by 2030. And we also uh, propose to launch a new European rooftop initiative, which includes um, uh, this idea of um, making compulsory for certain categories of buildings, the installation of solar rooftops. And, and finally, we want to develop um, in the in the coming years and at a much more accelerated path, the development of uh, heat pumps. Uh, we would like to have 10 million units of heat pumps over the next five years. Yeah, um, as regards permitting, I already explained uh, that what we are proposing is a legislative um, change in the renewables directive. There we are establishing, in particular, um, um, an idea of developing what we call go areas, so areas that would be defined by the member states and in which uh, it will be easier for renewal projects to take off because there will be a certain number of requirements that will not be any more uh, needed. Uh, once the, um, um, the, the basic uh, strategic environmental impact assessments are already done in that, in that area. So this, we, uh, we think that it will allow us to uh, ensure that permitting takes place uh, in not more than one year from the moment that the authorization is, is required. Uh, in addition to this legislation that we put forward, we also collect um, very good best practices that we have observed in different member states about how to accelerate permitting procedures. Uh, and we put it together in a, in a, in a kind of document with best, uh, best practices, as well as a recommendation on how to speed uh, the different for procedures for authorization. We also have um, in that recommendation uh, a specific um, recommendation about um, how to enhance power purchase agreements for renewable installations, so ensuring that uh, these contracts help also to the financing of new projects. Solar, I already covered that um, uh, with the target that I mentioned. Of course, very important is not only to enhance renewable electricity, but also renewable gases. And here, our main focus is basically on hydrogen and biomethane. Um, uh, on hydrogen, we already had uh, a very important uh, proposal of legislation at the end of last year, uh, where we established the new market rules for the development, on, development of hydrogen. This is completed, has been completed now in May. 
with two important delegated acts defining when uh, hydrogen can be considered as renewable hydrogen. And we considered that with that, we would have closed the circle in terms of uh, the, uh, the legal um, framework that is needed to ensure that hydrogen starts to, um, I mean, there's certainty for investors wanting to invest in hydrogen markets. What we also want to have in future is um, um, uh, to develop um, hydrogen at um, a level which is much higher than what we had expected uh, initially. So indeed, what we do in Repower EU is to double our target of renewable hydrogen um, production and imports. We will be having uh, 20 million tons of, um, of uh, renewable hydrogen uh, in the next decade, 10 of them produced in Europe, and another 10 we expect to import them from third countries, for which we will need to uh, enhance our cooperation with them and, uh, and sign what we call hydrogen partnerships uh, that uh, would allow those, those third countries to have technology and innovation on hydrogen from European companies, and that over time would allow us to import that renewable hydrogen into Europe. On biomethane, we also have a very clear um, uh, high ambition of producing 35 BCM of biomethane a year in Europe. Um, and to do that, we come up with, uh, with an action plan in the, Repower, in the Repower EU, which includes things like creating uh, an industry alliance for biomethane or uh, enhancing the role of uh, biomethane energy communities. And the, uh, the final block that, uh, that we have in, Repa in Repower EU is very much um, to move our um, um, provision of gas from Russia to elsewhere for all those quantities that, as I said, we will still need to consume in the coming, in the coming years due to the fact that we cannot um, save uh, enough energy and we cannot replace all the gas uh, that we, that we uh, consume currently with renewable energy. But as you can see in this, uh, in this slide, we have already done a very important work just for a number of reasons. On the one hand, um, uh, Russia has disrupted, unfortunately, uh, gas supplies in many markets, but also some European gas companies have started to restrict themselves from buying uh, gas from Russia. And this has made that already now we have halved, as you can see, as compared to last year, the amount of, of gas that we, that we import from Russia. And we have exploded in terms of um, buying gas from all the suppliers, notably through LNG. The purpose uh, over the coming months is to continue this, this trend um, and to uh, reach out and sign agreements and contracts with alternative suppliers. And a very big step was already done with the US uh, where there was a joint statement by um, uh, President von der Leyen and President B Biden um, to ensure that uh, Europe has additional um, BCM of gas in the next two years. Finally, all this will not be possible without money. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Repower EU does not come up with additional sources of money um, uh, to the EU budget. Um, this is not uh, the, the obviously what the what the member states wanted to 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 have or were willing to uh, to create in addition. So what we do is to make sure that um, we free certain parts of the existing EU budget. Uh, to be able to meet uh, the Repower EU objective. How do we do this? Well, on the one hand, there is a chapter, uh, sorry, there's a, a, a strand within the uh, recovery and resilient um, facility, uh, which includes loans that is still available and that we very much encourage the member states to use in order to achieve the Repower EU objectives. But we also include a couple of flexibilities so that... Um, uh, the member state can use up to 12.5% of the funds of their funds under the cohesion funds or the uh, uh, of the agricultural policy funds uh, into um, sorry all the cohesion funds uh, into the um, repower EU objectives. They could also um, we we also propose that they um, revise. 
um, their um, the plans on uh, resilience and uh, recovery uh, facility, so that there is a new chapter for Repower EU, so that they can uh, explain how they intend to use the existing funds under under the RRF. Uh, to um, uh, phase out, to do the investments that are necessary to phase out Russian fossil fuels. Yeah, and uh, finally, the last point I would like to make um, before we can discuss maybe further on, on, on some of these topics and, and replying to your questions is uh, the point concerning preparedness. Um, so we had calculated in the past um, that with all the measures that we put in the Repower EU, uh, we would be able to phase out um, uh, Russian fossil fuels well beyond the end of well before the end of the decade. But for the very next uh, winter, the next uh, heating season, this will not be possible to be replaced fully with all the measures that we have today. Um, so certainly um, we need to be prepared for the difficult months that could come ahead of us. And this is why um, the plan also includes a number of measures to be prepared for any potential additional disruption coming, uh, coming from uh, operated by Russia. Uh, what we propose on the one hand is to, as I said at the beginning, continue working very much on energy savings. Um, these behavioral campaigns, but also uh, accelerating as much as possible our energy efficiency measures that we have already put forward in the past. Uh, but more specifically, we also want to work with the member states um, so that we can coordinate better um, what will happen in case of additional disruptions in the different European regions. And, and to do that, on the one hand, uh, member states, uh, well, we are, calling, uh, we are calling the member states to conclude more bilateral solidarity agreements, with, which, which is an instrument that is already available under the, uh, the gas security of supply regulation, but it's unfortunately not very, not very much used. There's only a handful of these agreements between the member states that uh, serve notably to help each other in case that one of them has a security of supply concern in the gas market. Secondly, we um, also want to provide uh, specific uh, guidance to the member states about what kind of business and industries they would need to um, curtail uh, in a priority way in case that there is not enough gas for all. Uh, this is notably in order to ensure that what we call in the uh, gas security of supply regulation protected customers, meaning mainly households, will continue to have gas um, uh, in a pref in a, uh, with a with a privilege in a privileged way. So it will be uh, businesses which will might need to to um, uh, decrease their consumption of energy, and finally. Um, we are also working uh, with the member states in a specific technical group called the Gas Coordination Group to um, help them update their contingency plans. So the plans um, in case that there will be security of supply problems in, in, in the territory. Very good. That's all from me. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very conscious that I had to go very quickly through some of these uh, topics, but uh, very much looking forward to answering your question and, and going more into details. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. So before uh, opening the floor up to questions from participants, I would first like to uh, give uh, a few uh, responses, the chance to react to the Commission's proposals. Um, first, I would like to give the word to uh, Marta Navarrete uh, from um, uh, the European Policy and Regulation Manager at uh, Iberdrola, who will give us a perspective uh, from uh, the electricity industry, how they are um, uh, seeing uh, the Commission's uh, proposals. So if she can be unmuted. Uh, hello, can you can you yes. hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Is it, can I put my camera on? Or that's not possible. Oh yeah, yeah. If you, if you want, yes. I, I I don't I don't see the option. Yeah. Okay. I don't have the option in my screen. Well, 
strange. Well, anyway, thank you very much uh, for the for the very for the opportunity to 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 get the floor, and thank you very much, Tatiana, for a very clear presentation. Um, actually, from Iberdrola, we fully support uh, the, the Repower EU plan presented by the Commission, and, and we are ready to increase our efforts in order to deploy renewables uh, faster and, and also some of the other measures. Um, we are facing a terrible uh, situation, uh, but uh, we think that it's very important that the current geopolitical context does not decrease our ambition, our climate ambition, uh, I think at this point in time, we really need to, to increase our efforts in order to become uh, carbon neutral and in order to be resilient and autonomous. Um, uh, that this is quite important. So from our point of view, the priority should be accelerating the, the renewables, uh, front loading um, uh, investments for direct electrifications for those sectors that can be electrified like road transport, heating and cooling and then accelerate renewable hydrogen in those other sectors where we can actually not electrify directly. And, and, and finally, also very important to accelerate uh, the delivery of flexibility sources like storage, because we will need them um, as we increase the share of renewables in the system. Um, uh, we also need to take into account the current context of extremely high energy prices. Um, and we think any measures that are adopted need to, need to need to take into account uh, these and, and from our point of view it's very important to avoid any direct or indirect subsidies to fossil fuels as this will only increase our, our, our dependency on gas and will increase the power prices and, and here I would like to, to mention in particular the additionality and, and the delegated act that was published um, a couple of days after of the of the Repower EU presentation of the Commission, um, um, so so this concerns the, the the definition of what is green hydrogen, uh, which is extremely important. Um, we actually are we are really in Iberdrola. We really defend the concept of additionality. We think that without additionality, the increase in the power demand to produce hydrogen will only be covered by an increase in, uh, in fossil fuel electricity. This will increase CO2 emissions, emissions and unfortunately will lead also to further increase in the power prices. And this will undermine the competitiveness of our European industry and, and also will highly impact households. Um, so we need to promote green hydrogen. In Iberdrola, we have a lot of projects um, on, on green hydrogen, but not to the expense of additionality. Um, so we are quite critical about the proposal of the Commission to introduce a grandfathering rule that would actually exempt electrolysis that enter into operation before 2027 from complying with the additionality principle. This is something that is quite worrying for us. Uh, we think we need to accelerate renewables um, as much as possible to, to, to directly electrify, but also to produce green hydrogen. But the solution to this is to tackle the most urgent bottleneck, which is permitting. And in that sense, it's really good the provisions that the Commission has put forward on, on, on permitting. We just hope that we, we, we are able to, yeah, yeah, that, they, that they are implemented as soon as possible, because it's, it's now that we need those measures. And then just to finish, a couple of questions on, on, on my end. The first one is on permitting. Um, and it's about how do you see the next steps for the negotiations on the permitting aspects of the Repower EU? So we have seen that the French presidency has presented a, a new proposal on permitting at the council, but it doesn't incorporate all, all the elements of the, of the Repower EU. And in the, in the parliament, I think there is also, I mean, those elements have also not yet taken into account in the negotiations. So how do you see the next steps? Do you think it's gonna be incorporated into the existing red negotiations or do you see this something, something that would be maybe taken out separately through an urgent procedure, like for instance, the gas, gas storage regulation? And then just the last question, um, you mentioned that the disruption from gas supply uh, as part of the preparedness plans. And in the council, um, it was mentioned last week, um, the possibility of introducing a, a gas cap on imports in case of disruption. So I was wondering if you could give us additional information on, on, on this potential option. Thank you very much. And I, I stop there.
Thank you very much. Uh, maybe before uh, answering, letting uh, Tatiana answer the questions, I would first uh, like also the the other respondents to give their reactions. Uh, then maybe now Lucy Boost from uh, Equinor, um, who is uh, the uh, EU Affairs Manager at Equinor, who can give us a perspective from uh, the gas industry. I would also ask you to um, please keep it uh, within the two minute uh, time time limit so we can also actually get to uh, answering the questions, of course. Thank you. Yes, you should be uh, unmuted. But we don't hear you uh, right now. Okay, maybe there's some uh, technical issues. Maybe we can first uh, give a feeling to uh, Mendy from um, uh, BASF uh, the chance uh, to to give us a. Uh, his reactions on the repower EU proposals by the Commission before uh, maybe trying again, uh, Lucy from Equinor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and also, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uriata, for this very good overview uh, presentation of the Re uh, repower EU plan. Um, uh, I'm sure um, you will not be surprised if I mentioned that the European chemical industry and with that also we at BASF, uh, one of the main users of hydrogen, um, both uh, energetic, uh, but as well um, as a feedstock um, where um, there are no possibilities right now to substitute hydrogen. Um, uh, we believe that the 10 million um, uh, domestic produced hydrogen target plus additional 10 millions of imported green hydrogen is a very, uh, very ambitious target. And maybe let me say upfront, um, from a BSF point of view, we're fully supporting these targets as well as mentioned, uh, the mentioned diversification, um, as well as the ambitions to increase the renewable energy targets. Um, what worries us um, is that we currently do not see how these targets and especially the hydrogen target can be achieved. Um, on the one hand, there is no hydrogen infrastructure in place. And we have not made the experience that infrastructure comes uh, quickly and easily. Uh, and from our point of view, um, this is the must have actually um, to really make um, the hydrogen economy happen. On the other hand, um, uh, the commission published also the long awaited delegated act already mentioned um, from my colleague before um, on electricity for H2 production. and. What we see is instead of keeping the criteria lean, um, the Commission uh, proposed a, a complication of the existing uh, and working system of guarantees of origins. Um, and we believe that this system, right or as proposed, is rather a hurdle um, than a kickstarter for the um, hydrogen uptake, especially when it comes to industrial scale hydrogen production. Um, uh, with more and more renewable energy in the system, um, the problem of a possible usage of green electricity, uh, we believe at least uh, will decrease rapidly. That said, we believe that this, that this delegated act is actually over-regulating a timely limited problem, which is not even proven that it will become a, pro a problem, nor that the granular guarantees of origin system will be an effective tool um, to tackle this. Um, uh, that said, my question to you would be, um, how does the Commission plan to reach the availability of clean hydrogen at low cost? And how should industry fulfill a fixed quota for green hydrogen as long as um, such availability is not ensured? Last but not least, uh, I have one more question, and this is, uh, will the Commission encourage elect uh, electrification which is not only for the chemical industry a central lever, um, or do you plan to extend the application of this additionality criteria um, to electricity use in general? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Firenk, for your reactions. Uh, then maybe we can try uh, Lucy again. Yes, you're unmuted again, but we don't hear anything yet.
yeah, there seems to be some technical issues. So I would just then uh, ask you, uh, Tatiana, to uh, answer the questions of the respond of the previous respondents. Thank you. Very good, with pleasure. Um, well, thanks a lot for um, to 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 the two of them um, for this um, this critical assessment of the plan and uh, and some of the um, of the provisions that go together with it. Um, maybe um, yeah, on the permitting, which is. Uh, it's not easy because I cannot read on the on the crystal ball for the time being, but uh, it, it's a short answer. Um, we would like uh, the French presidency and, of course, the parliament to push for the um, inclusion of all our provisions proposed in the Repower EU concerning uh, permitting. Already when um, the French presidency comes up, with the uh, general approach that they intend to um, they intend to put forward before the uh, French presidency ends at the end of June. Um, we did this uh, proposal of additional permitting provisions precisely because we think that they are necessary and it's timely to include them into the um, renewal directive that is currently being discussed by the Parliament and the Council. We are doing everything that is in our hands to make it, it happen. We would have also liked that they take on board um, our proposal of increasing the renewables target from 40 to 45 percent. But we also understand that maybe the target is not the most important thing. Uh, what it, the, the industry is really looking forward is to ensure that the permitting procedures are. Um, uh, dealt with in the most effective way and efficient way, and the uh, the timelines are reduced. Um, my commissioner is going uh, next week to the European Parliament. It's going to meet again the ITRE committee, uh, and there's going to be a debate on the uh, on the Repower EU. And one of the things that uh, she would um, highlight again and stress again is the need of moving also in these permitting procedures. So we hope. Uh, we are still in very close discussions with uh, both the Council and the par Parliament, and we hope that um, our proposals are taken fully already at this stage of the, um, of, the, of the negotiations. Of course, it would be possible also, and we wouldn't be close to other options, like as, as, as it was mentioned by Marta, uh, a fast track process. But I think that um, it's very unlikely that that will happen. Um, uh, be if 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 um, it, it cannot be those provisions cannot be included already at this uh, at this point in time of the um, of the main uh, negotiations, so I, we are still working on 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 that basis as our um, main priority, and, uh, and and we will be continuing pushing for it uh, in the in the coming weeks uh, of the month of June. Um, concerning the issue of um, the hydrogen and the uh, delegated acts, maybe I start with the more general considerations from um, Mr. Demendi on the um, on how the Commission intends to um, multiply and duplicate the amount of hydrogen, renewable hydrogen that we produce and we import in Europe. Um, he mentioned in particular infrastructure, and we also think that infrastructure is a very, uh, a very important point. This is why precisely the Repower EU uh, that was adopted on the 18th of, of May uh, includes or was adopted at the same time as the launching of a new uh, call for projects under the, um, um, uh, the uh, uh, 10E regulation for uh, European, um, uh, European projects of common interest. So additional infrastructure that would be needed to be developed in the coming years in order precisely to um, achieve our decarbonization objectives, but also our new Repower EU objectives. And as, as, uh, as you may know, already since the adoption of the new 10E regulation that was adopted um, at the beginning of this year, uh, we have um, the possibility of uh, designing uh, as projects of common interest and 
also offering connecting euro facility funds to projects that are specific to um, hydrogen uh, infrastructure so everything that has to do from hydrogen dedicated pipelines to hydrogen storage or in inclusive um, uh, the um, establishment of uh, renewable hydrogen electrolyzers. So all that could be considered as from now on as a project of common interest. This is why we have already uh, launched the first call um, where we expect to have at least some hydrogen projects included. And there will be another call early 2023 for all those projects that are still not ready, but that we we hope that will be ready by then. So indeed infrastructure, it's very important, the development of um, hydrogen infrastructure for ensuring the uh, overall scaling up of the hydrogen market. And we are doing it by designating projects of common interest in the, in the, in the field of hydrogen. The delegated acts are also a very important part, but as you can see from the interventions of uh, of the two commentators, um, Ferenc and, 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 and Marta, um, you can see that the stakeholders are very much uh, in opposing views. Uh, you have a group of, uh, of, uh, of stakeholders who want this definition of uh, renewable hydrogen to be very lenient in order to rightly so um, try to ensure that uh, this, this new market, this new sector scales up and does not have too many uh, requirements to be met. But there's also the, uh, the perspective that was, uh, that was made by Iberdrola, that if we do not uh, make some, 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 some safeguards to ensure that this renewable hydrogen really comes from renewable electricity, because obviously when you produce the renewable hydrogen and you just take the electricity from the grid, you cannot see whether the electrons are coming from renewable energy or from fossil fuels. Uh, so if you don't put these safeguards uh, into place, what you can do is that somehow you can cannibalize the existing renewable electricity that is in the grid and uh, and and just um, uh, use it for a hydrogen a hydrogen production, whereas you you need that renewable electricity for many other users. Um, and uh, it's true that the production of renewable hydrogen will uh, require a massive amounts of electricity. Uh, this is why we 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 have a mandate uh, by the uh, legislator in the um, existing renewable directive that we needed to look into these aspects when coming up with this delegated act defining what renewable hydrogen is. So um, we have put forward a proposal, uh, as it was said, a couple of days after the uh, the, the Repower EU plan um, about how, how the definition could look like. Uh, now it's open to stakeholders uh, a public consultation for um, for um, four weeks. Um, it should finish, I think, around the 17th of, of, of this month. And we expect to, um, to have... Um, to have the type of arguments that you have uh, heard today, uh, uh, probably uh, with more data and more um, insight information that we may have overlooked. And on the basis of this, we will revise our proposal and we will adopt the final, the final text of the delegated act that as any other delegated act will uh, still be um, scrutinized by the, by the European Parliament and the Council and they will have two months to react. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that that basically covers, uh, covers it. There are many things, uh, just to come back, come back to BA, um, to Basf's, um, uh, point about how to ensure that hydrogen, uh, really comes out. Um, we think that we have been doing a lot in the last months, uh, in order to achieve, um, that hydrogen, uh, really scales up. My commissioner is personally very committed to the development, development of hydrogen. And we think that already we did a very big step in December last year when we adopted the market rules for the hydrogen dedicated uh, infrastructure. So basically, what are the principles that are going to, um, that are going to um, be applicable uh, to the use of that infrastructure? Third party access, um, uh, regulated tariffs or negotiated tariffs, 
um, the uh, the um, uh, the development. I mean, who's going to pay for it? Um, for those de dedicated infrastructure. So all of that has been already proposed by the Commission, and we think that the, the, the proposal that we made at the time in December, um, which has not been uh, agreed yet by the Parliament and the Council, is balanced in the sense that on the one hand, we have come up with, uh, with um, uh, certainty for the investors about how those dedicated infrastructures will uh, would look like in the future and what are the rules that would apply to them. But at the same time, we also foresee transitional periods in order to uh, ensure that the existing ones that are there do not have to comply with all the different criteria that we put forward and to ensure that the new ones that will be developed, um, at, the, at least at the beginning, they have a little bit more of flexibility um, to, to start their operation. We have the same um, the same point of um, of view concerning the delegated acts on on hydrogen. Um, we want to have rules that um, ensures additionality, as Marta say, but at the same time we also provide for a period of transition, where we think that uh, it will be easier for hydrogen producers to uh, start their investments. And this, as it, it was mentioned by, by Marta in our proposal, it includes a grandfathering provision for electrolyzer installations that come into operation before 2027. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, maybe I can uh, first a question I uh, personally had. Uh, so for... Um, the, uh, the 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 repower EU communication, the original one uh, uh, published uh, in uh, March, uh, still talked about a two thirds reduction of Russian gas imports by the end of the year. Uh, since a total of, of 155 billion cubic meters of uh, gas was imported from Russia last year, uh, this implies uh, cutting Russian imports to 55 uh, billion cubic meters this year. Uh, the Repower EU plan released in May does not uh, mention this target anymore. So is this no, no longer the objective that the Commission uh, pursues or proposes? And if this is still uh, the, the objective, uh, then is it still feasible to achieve this as we are already over uh, 40 uh, BCM of uh, natural gas imports from Russia uh, this year and the heating season has not yet started? So. So, uh, yes, indeed, in the communication early March, we say that we would um, that we estimated that around two thirds of the existing uh, gas consumption or the uh, gas consumption that we had last year from Russia could be um, could be phased out. Um, so, out of the 155 BCM, 100 BCM could be achieved already this year. Um, it's true that we don't mention it anymore in the Repower EU. Uh, I think it's uh, it's um, uh, is more um, due to the fact that well we we are going into more concrete measures and we do not uh, need to. Um, I mean, we are not talking anymore about figures, but we go into uh, what each of these measures would. Um, deliver in terms of BCMs and uh, I cannot put you again my my presentation but in one of the slides you can see that uh, if you if you basically sum up um, the different um, the different measures that we put forward for uh, in the in the Repower EU for this year we still expect that we will have uh, a massive reduction. I don't know if two thirds, uh, but certainly a very important reduction um, of the uh, of the existing gas consumption. And as, as I said in the presentation, some of these reductions have already happened because we have massively reduced the amount of Russian gas in the first uh, in the first months of the year, either because the uh, private companies have decided to start this process themselves, or because the Russians have obliged us to do so. Um, having uh, disrupted uh, gas supplies in many European markets. So this is perfectly possible, we think, but obviously um, I'm not going to um, uh, uh, I'm not going to lie to the uh, to the participants. It's going to be complicated because of 
several reasons. First, because it requires the engagement of everyone. Things like behavioral change, reduction of energy consumption is something that I still uh, do not see that has been uh, um, internalized by many, many citizens uh, in Europe. And uh, even if we were going to massively reduce our energy consumption and uh, massively expand our renewables, the, and uh, there is a still a part, as I said, that would still need to be replaced by gas from other sources. And, uh, and, and probably also uh, in some regions, in some days of uh, next winter, we might also need to see some contingency measures that would need to be deployed. This is something that we do not exclude at all and that uh, this is why we are working on it to be ready for that you probably have seen already um, similar assessment being made by uh, the director of the international energy agency yesterday uh, we think we need to be we, we need to be prepared for for difficulties next winter uh, thank you um maybe i can maybe there's still room for one question from uh, the audience uh, adina georgescu you um you can maybe uh come in but uh, i would uh, ask to please keep it short since we have only four minutes left and uh, we would like to uh, finish in time of course uh yes thank you very much um hi tatiana good to see you again <laughs> um so i will be speaking on behalf of Eurometo. Um, I will be the next uh, well director for uh, energy and um, climate change. Um, the question is basically related to the containment plan and well the hard winter that is um, expecting uh, that we are having ahead of us. So we understand as energy intensive industries, we understand our commission is preparing good guidance and uh, and on well reducing energy demand. Uh, we are aware of the provisions of the regulation on energy um, of security of energy supply and uh, related um, and we also understand that the related measures are uh, taken and implemented at the member state level because the member state and national governments are implementing these measures but and we know that the industry world is the first one to be curtailed in such a forced major situation um, the question is, will the Commission guidance also address the unfortunate social impact of shutting down factories that uh, will happen if uh, this, uh, if the security of supply will be affected and also the related economic impact that the shutting down of factories will have on the overall EU and national economies and on the related supply chain uh, disruptions. So I know it's a very difficult question, Tatiana, and it is a, these are the worst times, let's say, to, to, be, to do, be doing business. But um, it is a valid question from our behalf. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I think it's a very valid question indeed, Adina. Um, and I can understand that the industry is concerned about that. What I can say, because the things are, are basically in the making and we are working on it as we speak, um, is that we are working on it. Uh, the European Council has um, uh, requested the Commission to come up with a coordinated contingency plan. Um, on this, we expect to already have it ready as soon as possible. Certainly, if not for the uh, um, Energy Council um, later this month, uh, for the European Council also at the end of the month. So this is something where we would like to move very, very quickly to ensure that we have uh, basically that member states have the guidance and that we do this in a coordinated way, ensuring also that there are the least possible distortions between business in different member states as regards curtailment and so on. But most importantly, I think that uh, beyond this coordination of the uh, possible curtailment and contingency measures, uh, the Commission is working to ensure that there are as few curtailments as possible so that there is enough gas, enough energy for everyone. And um, what we are doing, um, and I didn't mention in my presentation, among all the measures is that we have created a platform, an energy platform that will coordinate um, uh, in a, for the member states and companies that voluntarily want to 
uh, by the uh, the energy, the gas, in a coordinated way, uh, to be able to do so and to have a, you know have contracts with uh, alternative third countries, and uh, achieve uh, in a coordinated way the best possible prices for the gas that we buy. So we will be acting obviously on the quantities, so the amount of volumes of gas that we will be able to buy, but also on the price. Um, and, um, and this is our main objective. So ensure that we ensure the diversification for next winter, that we have uh, put all the members all the measures in place to ensure that there will not be um, uh, energy demand that is not met. But in the case that uh, there will be um, some days or some moments or some regions in Europe, obviously will not be everything and everyone at the same time, which will have a certain demand that would not be met, we should be ready for um, having a coordinated reply. I hope that due to the, uh, to the measures that we are working on, uh, we will not be in front of, as you mentioned, uh, significant social impacts or economic impacts for the company. And certainly I, I don't, um, I mean, we are working and doing everything possible, you know, to um, uh, coordinate uh, and uh, be prepared for this situation and avoid by all means, as you put it, uh, to have any kind of uh, shutting down of, 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 of factories. This is certainly not the scenarios uh, that on which we are working. And, uh, and, 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 and we think that, um, that this is not going to happen. But uh, this does not exclude, as I said, that in some regions, in certain days, particularly, I don't know, we don't know what the weather forecast is going to be next winter, but if there was going to be a cold spell, we cannot foresee, uh, we cannot exclude that there will not be certain difficult measures that obviously will affect uh, primarily uh, business. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that uh, already uh, brings an end to our discussion. I uh, apologize to all the other participants who still had questions, but uh, we are at the time, I think, where's there, where there are uh, just too many questions. So um, my apologies. Um, I would uh, first like to thank uh, Tatiana uh, for joining us today, for taking the time to be with us uh, today and giving us some more insight into this topic that is uh, more relevant than it has probably ever been. Also would like to thank the respondents and uh, all the participants for joining us today and for the lively discussion during our uh, Q&A session. Uh, if you would want to rewatch this event, the recording will be made available on our website in the coming days. Um, I look forward to seeing hopefully many of you again at uh, one of our future events uh, at the European Policy Centre. Um, we are organizing still many other events on energy this month. Uh, please have a look at our website to see what we still have in store for you in the coming weeks and months. Hopefully uh, see you soon and uh, thank you very much for joining and bye.